Bib 1001, I know you're already missing class and wish I could be with you on Tuesday, but as you know, I have more important things to do, but I wanted to get this done for you and for you to be able to, I want you to watch it and to think about it, chew on it some. We got two main things that we want to talk about in this, in this time. The first thing is the structure of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. And so if I were to outline the structure, I would outline it by the days. And so we have day one, day two, day three, day four, five, six, and then over here we have day seven. And it's helpful to think about what gets created on each day. So on day one, we have God saying, let there be light, and there was light. And so day one, we have light and darkness. God separates the light from the darkness. And you'll notice, what does God call the light? You and I might call the light light, but God calls the light day, and the darkness God calls night. And so it's important to recognize that God's not just creating light, but God is creating the day. Calls the light day, calls the darkness night. On day two, God separates all the waters so that we got waters above and waters below. And so I'll kind of diagram that, that we have the waters up above held up by this dome. We got the waters down below, and then we got the, the space in between. And then on day three, God gathers the waters together and the focus becomes the land and the land is called earth. And so day three, we have the creation of the land or earth and the veggies uh, that are on the land. So we got land and vegetation on day three. Come over here to day four, and now we have God creating the heavenly bodies. And so we have the greater light that rules the day. So the sun rules the day. And then we have the lesser light that governs the night. And so we have the moon. And then we have the stars. So day four, we have sun, moon, and stars. Uh, day five, we have the creation of the fish, great sea creatures, and the birds. So fish and birds on day five. Then day six, we have the creation of the animals, and especially us, humanity. And then, as we saw on day seven, God rests and makes day seven holy. Now, when we look at this, it's easy to begin to say, okay, there's some problems here. And so, uh, I don't know about you, but it's kind of problematic to begin to think, okay, how do we get day and night before we have the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars? Well, we don't think that way. We think that the whole reason why we have a day is because we have the sun. Um, how do you get a day before you get the sun? In fact, how do you get three days before you get the sun and the moon and the stars? We also might be wondering how in the world do you get vegetation before you have the sun? And so when we just look at this, it becomes problematic and it doesn't solve all of our, all of our questions about how the world works. But what I want you to think about is what logic do you see here? And if you looked at it long enough, I'm guessing that you would begin to notice some things. And probably what you're going to notice is not simply that it doesn't fit our logic, our understanding of the way the world works, but that there's a correlation in the days. That there's a correlation between day one and day four. There's a correlation between day two and day five. There's a correlation between day three and day six. And we see this especially if we kind of start from the bottom and work our way back up. That on day three, God creates the land and the vegetation. And then what happens on day six is God fills the land with animals and humanity and tells us to be fruitful and multiply. And you'll see that God gives humanity dominion over everything that moves across the face of the earth. So day three, God has created the habitat or the domain for humanity to live in, to move about, to exercise dominion over. Same thing with day two and day five. That God creates the waters above and the waters below or separates the waters out so that now you have this expanse 
And what does God do on day five? He fills these habitats with the creatures that are going to move about those habitats and live in them. And so the fish and the birds are created, and God blesses them and tells them to be fruitful and multiply and to fill their habitats. So then when we look up at day one and day four, again, God's not just creating light. God calls the light day. And so we have this habitat of day, this domain of day. So what does God do on day four? God fills the day with the sun. And the sun is the body that moves about the day, that circles over it and exercises authority, dominion, rules the day, governs the day. And then the same thing, the darkness is no longer just darkness. Now the darkness is the domain or the habitat of night. And so the lesser light, the moon, governs the night. And the stars are there and they govern the seasons. And so what we see going on in terms of structure is that this filling is going on. And so on days one, two, and three, God is creating habitats or domains. And then on days four, five, and six, those habitats are being filled with the creatures that are going to move about and exercise dominion in those habitats or over those habitats. So then when we think about day seven, What's going on with day seven? How does day seven fit in with that structure? Well, going back to our discussion in class, these first six days, God's creating his domain, his temple. And then what God does on day seven, God rests, God makes it holy. God is the one who's moving in and filling the universe with his presence. So that God is not just creating it and then living someplace else, watching and not engaged or involved. And yes, God is more than this. He's the creator of this all. But at the same time, God moves in and inhabits it and dwells in it and fills it with his presence. And so we see the structure of it, days one, two, and three, creating habitats. Day four, five, and six, creating the creatures, the bodies that are going to move in and fill those habitats and exercise dominion over them. And then on day seven, God is going to move in and fill the whole creation with his presence. So that's the big structure that we see in Genesis 1, 1, 2, 3. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is the uh, what it means for us to be created in the image of God. And really trying to work with just Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. And so we're going to try to limit ourselves to this passage of Scripture as we talk about what it means to be created in the image of God. And so we're kind of two questions here. What do we see about who God is? And then what does it mean for us to be created in God's image? And so assuming that you got this down, in fact, your assignment is to share this with somebody to explain this seven-day structure uh, to your roommate or to a friend. I'm going to go ahead and erase it, and then I'm going to list some things in terms of image of God. All right, Viv 1001. Now we're going to go on to part two, and part two is where we're going to talk about the image of God. What does it mean for us to be created in the image of God? And we're going to try to limit our thoughts to this passage of scripture. So if all we have is Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, what can we say, what can we learn about what it means to be created in the image of God? And that's kind of asking us to also think about, well, what is God's image? Uh, who is God that we meet here in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3? And as we talked about the other day, we see that God is creator and that God alone is the creator. This word bara. God is the only one who does that. But we are created in God's image, and so we do have a measure of creativity, but it is small c creativity. And so we build things, we make things, just as we see God building and making in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. So we are made in God's image. We have this ability that God has given us to be creative, uh, not to where we take God's place as the creator, but at the same time creative because of who God is and how God made us. And so we can make things, we can build things, we can organize things, we can structure things. 
So that's part of what it means to be created in the image of God. With this comes the power of speech. Speech have E-A or E-E? -E? My wife tells me it's E-E. -E. She was also filming this. And so, she didn't want you to know it was her. So anyway, so, so we have this, this capacity for speech. And again, we saw how did God make things? Well, God spoke everything into existence. And our speech is powerful. And so part of what it means for us to be created in the image of God is that our speech is powerful. We can build things, create things, make things with our words. We can also destroy things with our words. But the fact that our speech is so powerful, that's due to us being created in the image of God. So we did pause for a moment and just verify it is speech, E-E-C-H. The last thing I want to do is to teach you the wrong spelling of the word speech. So we got speech and we're created in the image of God. And so part of that means that our words have power. Uh, we see this show up all the time. Uh, Super Bowl's coming up. Just the uh, cost of the Super Bowl commercial. Why so much? Because you get a word in to so many people. And with your speech, you can create need. You can build people up. Uh, you can sadly tear people down. But the power of our human speech is because we're created in the image of God. Another area where we're sometimes thought about in terms of us being created in the image of God is the emphasis on dominion. And so you'll notice that God gives us dominion over everything that moves across the face of the earth. And so we're created to bear God's image, not our own image, and we have this dominion, this authority, but it's not really our authority, it's a God-given authority. And because we're in God's image, the way we exercise our authority should point people, should point creation to God. Now, one of the ways that this is thought of is in the ancient world, when an emperor conquered a territory, the emperor didn't stay there. The emperor's going to go back home. But what the emperor did was set up an image of himself. Might be a statue, might be on the coins that they would now have to use. But the people living in that vicinity that had been conquered, they would see the the image of the emperor all over the place. And what that image would do, it would communicate to them that they're under the rule of the emperor. Even though the emperor may not be there physically ruling, yet they're under the word that comes from that emperor and the image is reminding them of whose authority they are under. And so some would say that that's how we are to understand this dominion and this being created in God's image that we are representatives of God, if you will, reminders of creation, uh, reminders to creation and to each other that we are all under the rule of God. Uh, another way you might think about it in terms of we don't do so much with statues and images that way, but when the U.S. Uh, landed somebody on the moon, what did they do? Well, they put a United States flag on the moon. Why? Well, that flag was to communicate to everybody that would see it that the moon is now under the authority of the United States. Okay, and so, you know, it's kind of like the moon is ours. We want everybody to know that that flag communicates to all of space and everyone else that might be on the moon or visit the moon that this is under U.S. dominion. Okay, what if we're flags of God? That what it means for us to be created in the image of God means that we are flags that God has placed upon the earth to remind the earth, to remind each other of who actually rules. And so we exercise our authority, our dominion, in a way that points people to who God is. God becomes visible through how we use that authority. Uh, fourth one, and that would be a capacity for relationship. And so what we see God doing throughout Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is creating beyond God's self. That God is not content to simply be God and have nothing else exist. That God calls a world into existence and interacts with that world and gives God's self to that world. So that God is this, this kind of interactive, giving, self-giving being. 
And so to be, for us to be created in the image of God means that we are going to have this capacity for relationship, this capacity to be turned outwards, this capacity to give ourselves away in relationship. And we see God blessing. And so the capacity for relationship and the capacity to bless one another in relationship. And again, we see God creates us male and female uh, so that we can give ourselves to each other. And so we have a God who is, you know, kind of bent on relationship. And we see this in God. We see him creating a world that is other than himself and yet engaged and interacting and present to and within this world. And so for us to be created in the image of God, then we're going to follow suit and we're going to be turned outwards instead of in on ourselves. And we're going to be in a giving relationship to each other. And as we do that, we are bearing the image, reflecting the image, uh, showing the world and each other who God is. And my phone keeps going off. So let me go ahead and try to wrap this up. That to be created in the image of God, we can kind of think about it in these areas of creativity, power of our speech, dominion. But I think especially this capacity for relationship. And in many ways, this would be love. That it's love that drives God to create beyond God's self. And whenever we are turned upwards to God, outwards to each other, then we are most living into what it means to be created in the image of God. But whenever we're stuck on ourselves and we're just kind of turned in on ourselves and self-absorbed, we're actually living against how God created us to be. Well, that's plenty for you to chew on today. We'll come back, talk a little bit more about this stuff on Thursday, uh, go a little bit more with some stuff from Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, and then we'll get into the story of the creation of Adam and Eve on Thursday. So thanks for watching, thanks for tuning in, and I'll look forward to seeing you on Thursday. God bless.